Good morning. Good to be with you in the house of the Lord. And uh, this Lord's Day, we want to begin a little differently. We, we have a, a dear brother who is, uh, has some relatives in this church, one uh, Pam Rogers and uh, Lloyd Termont. And uh, he's served our community for the Lord Jesus Christ so faithfully. And uh, we, we certainly are not trying to highlight people per se, uh, but the, the good news of the, of the Lord and his, his work through uh, different people in different ways. And uh, just happened to, to see this uh, online and thought it would be a, a great thing for us to rejoice in uh, the testimony of, of God's good work in Lloyd Termot. So we're just going to uh, switch to a brief video, and then we'll come back to the announcements. <clears throat> Atsuma State Assembly, 26th Assembly District, and we're down here. I'm following Lloyd Termot and guys from the First Reformed Church of Cedar Grove and their furniture ministry. And I'm just fortunate today to, to ride along with them and see what they're doing. So I'm really happy to, to have this Hometown Hero Award that we can give to folks like Lloyd. Are you interested in a, a, a wheelchair? Yes, definitely. Yes. When can you pick it up or when can I drop it off? So we started word of mouth. I had a trailer in my construction business and we would load them up and maybe three weeks or so come down here to her place and then it just kind of expanded and most of the people call me directly. I think we average three loads a week. You would be shocked and surprised how many people move into properties and you see a lot of movement and they have kids and they have absolutely no furniture. It's kind of hard to comprehend that. When I am go to bed at night, I got a nice bed, pillow to lay on, blankets to cover up with. I've been blessed. Furniture is sometimes an area that's really, really missed. And um, there's not a lot of resources that will give away free things to people. All right, and that, that's what this is. Lloyd is the one who started this mission. He's our, our driver, our mentor, our inspiration. And I, I would say there has to be at least 20 calls, phone calls that he makes in order to set up one run. I just had a person call me this morning for a wheelchair. He, he has an engine that goes and goes and goes and goes. It's nothing but God can, that can assemble a group of men like that and have them be so consistent. If somebody would have told me that 40 years, you're gonna be hauling three loads a week to Milwaukee. No, I would never. Lloyd is the most humble person you will ever meet. This is 40 years of commitment, 40 years of work. And if you ask Lloyd, it's, it's his faith that drives him to do this. The Lord has blessed me with good health. 80 years old, a lot of my friends are gone already. And why is he giving me this strength? I think that's the reason why, to go and help other people. It's just a wonderful thing that we can recognize people from our communities that go above and beyond. And I'm just so glad that I'm able to witness this today and bring this appreciation that we have to Lloyd. seen that, uh, and if not, I just thought it'd be uh, appropriate to think about uh, a man, uh, a uh, father in the Lord and many, for many um, who has served so faithfully in this way, uh, reaching out beyond the boundaries of the, the church itself and serving the community, so we're so thankful for his testimony. Some other things to bring to your attention, uh, joint youth ministry uh, announcements that John asked me to put before you this morning. The Soup Songs and Serving Christ fundraiser is 10 days away. So mark your calendars for Wednesday, February 21st to enjoy Wisconsin cheese chowder, chicken wild rice, or Dutch chili dump from 4.30 to 6.30 with a concert by the Connect Band in the sanctuary to follow. There are still a couple of $10 and $20 envelopes in the narthex if you'd like to donate ingredients for the soup, which can be turned into the offering before next Sunday the 18th. All proceeds will go toward, towards the high school summer mission trip to Baltimore. And, and a, he offers a thank you for 
the continued support of our youth. All right, and then uh, I did tell you last week that uh, Shannon's eye procedure went well, but I couldn't find my announcement. So I have to share it with you. You just have to bear with me. Uh, she is seeing well and looking good. Like that one? All right. <clears throat> it's given her a whole new vision for her life. For the other eye, we are looking at March. I'm a bit blurry on that, but I think it's the first week of March. Come on, these are good. Nice. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll keep that week in sight and uh, see what happens. But, but I envision a great outcome, and Shannon is looking forward to it. All right, th those are all the ones I could bring forward. That was pretty sad. <clears throat> That's dad jokes uh, gone wild. Today is second Sunday lunch, and you probably can smell it. It smells so good. I just want to go down and eat right now, but uh, you are invited, um, and uh, it's going to be a good time. The fellowship is just as good, but uh, we're thankful for, for those who put this together and those who are able to bring a dish, uh, but that is today following the service of worship. Our birthdays this week, we have on the 12th, Raina Postuma. Happy birthday to you, and on the 13th, Noah DeHai and Alex Clearbelt, and on the 17th, Paul Musin. And we have no anniversaries this week. All right, with those things in mind, let's stand together and rejoice in the Lord. Let's hear the call to worship. <clears throat> Thinking about that wonderful day and in the world in which we live as the Lord gathers us together, we're not just worshiping him in the here and now, but we're looking toward that day. On that day, there will be a fountain open for the house of David to cleanse them from sin. On that day, Living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. God has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure as he is pure. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's rejoice and celebrate that day as we sing together on that day. We 
will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day. We will know you as we lift our voice as one. Till that day, we will praise you for your never-ending grace. And we will keep on singing on that glorious day. now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. So good to know. As we think about our challenges of sin and how we're not there yet, and we haven't been made perfect in Christ yet, we are so encouraged to know that he holds us. And we're reminded if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's go to our Lord in private prayer, and then we'll confess together as the body of Christ. Now let's look to the screens or our bulletins and confess together as the body of Christ. Holy Father of justice and grace, we confess falling short of your glory, giving in to temptation, committing and loving our sin. We have neglected your worship and will, dealt uncharitably with our neighbors, sinned in thought and speech, been discontent with daily bread and failed to seek first your kingdom and righteousness. Have mercy upon us, gracious Father. You are of purer eyes than to behold our iniquity, but promise mercy in Jesus Christ to all who repent and believe. We repent. By faith we confess Christ as our only hope. Forgive and change us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to our wonderful hope, which goes along with our song of assurance. My song is Love Unknown. From Ephesians chapter 1, In love, God predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Let's sing this hymn of assurance. My song is Love Unknown.
we'll have our deacons come this morning for our offering. And our psalm of praise will be Psalm 9, uh, version B. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you have made. We thank you so much for your care and your love for Calvary Orthodox Presbyterian Church, for the rich history we have, not of ourselves, but the history of your grace. We pray it would continue. You'd be pleased to uh, bring in what is needed to uh, fulfill the service of worship and the ministry of praise and the joy of exalting our Savior in this place and then out throughout the week. Bless now the gift and the giver, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to our Lord and Savior now for the church and the world in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. We lift before you 
our petitions, even as we praise you from our hearts and anticipate that you will hear and answer in accordance with your will. We continue to think, Lord, of those who are suffering from cancer and other debilitating diseases. We give you praise for uh, your, the life that you spare along the way. Uh, so many things, Lord, that would have caused us to depart this life years ago uh, with the various inventions and improvements in technology and increase of knowledge, Lord, we've been able to see so much progress. We give you the praise for that and thank you for the treatments that are available. Uh, we pray for a continued restoration of Jim Eklund and his injury to his, his leg and um, for Scott as he recovers from his heart attack. We thank you so much for sparing his life. We thank you for uh, caring for Carol um, over the years here. We pray you continue to strengthen her and give her joy in the Lord as she battles this lung disease. For those with cancer, Lord, who are battling uh, treatment and the side effects that come with that, we do rejoice. We thank you for Wendy. We thank you for Posey. And for Rich and Dave, we thank you for the ways in which you have been so kind and so gracious. We pray for our full recovery, but we commit them to you and to your care and to your will and your purpose, which is always the greatest. All of us, Lord, today have heaven before us. All of us know that the day will come when we have to uh, go behind that curtain, so to speak. But we long for the days that you give us, and we pray for that healing. We pray for that restoration. We also lift up those who are dealing with uh, mental challenges and emotional struggles and the things that often go unseen but are debilitating and, and uh, devastating in so many ways. We pray for those who help bear the burden of that. We pray for those who seek to address it. Lord, may your strength come in. May you provide joy for the depressed and, and strength for the faint of heart, encouragement for those weighed down in uh, the guilt of sin or conflict. We pray you bring release from these burdens and joy that comes in the Holy Ghost. We thank you for our children and our families. Lord, bless our husbands and wives. Bless their relationship in marriage and in parenting. Uh, bless the, the parenting uh, of those who have been called of you from all eternity. Lord, who have received promises in their baptism. May those things be fulfilled which you have put before us. We pray that you would use this church to fulfill those things. To put forth a means of grace, the preaching of the word and the sacraments and prayer the faithful teaching of your word in, in every way available to us. On that, Lord, we pray your blessing upon the teachers and the lessons today, from the young to the old. We thank you also for our, our full families, Lord, for each grandparent, with each of those with grown children, each of those with grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all the roles that we play in, in each other's lives as aunts and uncles and relatives. What a privilege it is, Lord, to be a part of the family of God. We pray our reach would go beyond the walls of the family of God to those who perhaps watch us in family relationships, those who are outside of our families who see the testimony of the gospel. May it be a faithful, bold testimony. For our sweet children, Lord, may they grow up in the faith. May they grow up to believe and to confess that you are Lord, you are Savior, and to follow you in the way. We pray for those who are lost. We pray for those who have professed faith but have wandered from it, for those who have renounced the faith, for those who are unsure. We pray that you would bring about your saving purposes. We pray for your mercy. You are a just and holy God, but you are also full of mercy and abounding in love, and they do not conflict. We pray for your mercy then to bring the wanderers home, to bring those who know not God to a place where they acknowledge you and confess you as Lord on this day before that day. Lord, we ask that you would help us in our nation to be faithful citizens, to put our hope and trust in the true and everlasting kingdom, but also to serve diligently for those serving in uh, the political arena, for those serving in the public square, for those who are enacting laws and, and working in the courts, those who are working politically in various ways, 
We ask you to be honored in all things. We ask for the glorious truth of the moral law to stand firm. We know it is eternal. We know it's not recognized as eternal. We know there's an an evil one who is at work. We know that uh, the kingdom of darkness is skilled and, and active, but so is the kingdom of light. We pray for all those who serve the kingdom of light outside the walls of this church, in community, in government, in, in uh, fire and rescue. In so many ways, we pray that the light would shine, that you would bless them and ha- enable each one to glorify you in their respective labors and fields. Lord, we ask for your mercy. We pray that mercy would also go out through the tombstones, uh, through the robins as they prepare and study for the field, uh, through the voskels, uh, jars, uh, Lord, so many missionaries that we desire to support and uphold the hops. We pray your blessing would be on the work and the labor of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through the work of missions here and around the world. Now we commit this day to you, and we pray you'd be honored in all things as you build us up in holiness and comfort. And we will continue to pray then, even as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Let's stand together as we read the rest of Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, and we have found our way down to verse 13, and we will read God's word. The grass withers, the flowers falls, but the word of the Lord abides forever. May it take root in our hearts. Therefore, one who speaks, oh, excuse me, I was looking at that going, well, I know we're not talking about tongues today, there we go. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. But decide, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is not good to eat meat, or excuse me, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. God's word, you may be seated. Well, to tell you what you already know, there are always those in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ who are weak in the faith, and then those who are strong in the faith. And that doesn't mean strength of belief. As Paul talks about the the weak and the strong, he's not referring to those who are strong in their assurance of salvation, per se, in saving faith, but those who are Strong in the sense of they have strength of convictions 
They know exactly what they believe. They're not rattled by various things. Their conscience is not tender. And that's not the same as having a seared conscience, but a, a conscience that is not overly sensitive regarding various Christian life matters. Whatever the practical issue, not all Christians, we would agree, are in the same place. If you recall, in verses 1 to 12, we were thinking about the strong and the weak Christians uh, together and their struggle not to judge one another. And just to kind of refresh your memory on that, as we look to this reality of not judging, we, we were thinking about the the call not to judge each other, but rather to accept or welcome. That, that is the language. As for the one in verse 1 who is weak in the faith, welcome him, which can mean to receive or to accept, but not to quarrel over opinions. And so we thought about that. Uh, why is this the case? Why is, is uh, Paul calling us not to judge each other? Well, because it's happening But he wants us to know that we are all welcomed by the Lord, and we saw it in these ways. The Lord welcomes those who are weak or strong in the faith, and so must we. He does so without disputing differences, we might say. He just accepts us, and that's how we are to be, without disliking or condemning each other. And then this language of welcoming in verse 1 and also in verse 3, God has welcomed him. There's a a flavor to that word that speaks of a very intimate, personal, close family relationship kind of welcoming, received as one of the family, as in when someone marries into the family. So, close family circle. That's how we're to think about each other, even if we're not the same. And then, as we think about the next reason, for each one belongs to the Lord. This is a significant thing. How do we belong to the Lord as his house servants? We said the word slave there is more of a, a personal servant in the house that's treated like family, like an indentured servant. We do this willingly. We belong to the Lord, and he treats us as family. We're close and under his care, but also as those who are responsible for our own conviction. We belong to the Lord. We answer to the Lord, and we're seeking to honor and thank the Lord, even if our version of it looks differently from someone else's. And We exist before the Lord. We exist for the Lord. So we have our own Holy Spirit. We don't need other believers to be our Holy Spirit. And then the final thing that Paul points us to is really convicting, and that is for each of us will answer to the Lord. Each one of us universally, there are no exceptions. Everyone's going to have to go through that same thing. And then each of us individually, so no one gets around it, But then each of us individually and personally will stand before the Lord. And so it is upon us to understand where we are in the Lord and make our decisions for ourselves. And that's not to exclude the reality that Christians do encourage and Christians do challenge one another if we're living in clear sin. Uh, So this is talking about debatable issues, differences of opinion, and we have a whole list of those So then he shifts a little bit, and I wanted to remind you of that because it's been a little while, but also to put before you the way it changes. This morning, one way to get our our heart and mind around God's exhortation to us is to see that while in verses 1 to 12, he is largely focused on our attitudes, how we think about other people on these issues, Now, beginning at verses 13 and following, he's thinking about our actions. Not just what we think about other people, but what do we do? How do we actually treat people? Paul challenges what we think about those whose opinions and practices don't align with us. And then to what we do as we interact with brothers and sisters who are in the same body of Christ, who are also united by faith to Jesus Christ with us in Christ. So don't cause your, the way I put it here was just so it would fit and you could see it. Don't cause family to stumble or fall. What we have in mind is not necessarily our blood family, but our spiritual family. He has some themes in here like our faith and our family and our freedom. Thought about that as a title, but then it would have sounded like a patriotic sermon, so I thought I might as well not even go there. 
But we are talking about causing our Christian family members to stumble or fall by how we act, how we treat them, how we act around them. And it's really important to point out that he's speaking of our brother and our sister, our Christian family. These are people in this body of Christ. We should absolutely love one another. When we take our membership vows and the body of Christ uh, receives someone, we should really understand that as not a, a kind of churchy OPC formality, but a way in which we articulate we are committing to one another to love one another, and there is no place for anything less than loving one another. And that challenges our hearts because we don't all mix well with, with everybody, right? Uh, and the, the body of Christ is one in Christ and called to love one another without exception. What are the reasons then, as Paul is thinking not in general of loving one another, but as Paul is thinking very specifically about an undefined challenge in, in the church at Rome, there were things related to food, related to days, uh, food and drink, and those kinds of things, but there's not much said beyond that. It's not as elaborate as, say, 1 Corinthians 8. So what is he up to here? We can keep it very general, and often we talk about this with respect to Christian liberty, uh, what we can and can't do. Uh, I think we can be in danger of going too broadly, too. But for the sake of really wrestling with how do we apply this to ourselves, and I found it somewhat challenging uh, because we will tend to go to uh, one or two things uh, based on sort of our, uh, I would say, our American culture. Uh, you wouldn't have the same exact challenge in Germany, per se, if you were to talk about alcohol um, or cigars and smoking. Uh, but there was a certain time in America where that kind of thing was a really big deal. The do's and don'ts or even dancing or what we called mixed bathing. So there, we tend to just go to those same particular issues. But if you can try to keep it at a broad level, you'll be there with Paul, who, who uses food, which was their particular issue, but we're not sitting around wrestling with food problems, I don't think. Um, I don't think we have any aggressive vegans or vegetarians here, but uh, if you do, God bless you, but we have to just think, how can we do this at the broad level? So let's, let's look at this together. We want to be exhorted by the Lord not to cause our Christian brothers and sisters to stumble or to fall, for the sake of Christ's love. Now, 13, verse 13 is a bridge. Therefore, let us not pass judgment. So, what is it therefore? Because of everything beforehand. But notice how he shifts. Instead of passing judgment, let's decide, rather, never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a, of a brother. It's one thing to look and evaluate people and say, oh, brother, look at them. They're so immature. Or to look at somebody else and say, they're just so liberal. Where are they even at with the Lord? We can get into that kind of perspective. Or we can say, hey, since we seem to be different, let me just keep an eye out and be, be careful that I, I don't act in a way that will cause my brother or sister to stumble, knowing that they seem to have a, a struggle with that particular reality. So there's a, a play on words. This word for judge, crino, is used twice here. We see it show up as don't pass judgment, but rather decide, which is sort of an English uh, nuance to the word judge, definitely one way to describe it. Um, there is an old translation that would put it this way, therefore let us cease judging one another, but rather make this simple judgment. That is, not to offend anybody. Don't offend, don't call someone to stumble. The first word there for stumbling is translated stumbling block because it's, it's really the idea of something that's a stone or something in the path that you can trip over. And then the, the second one has to do with scandal or scandalon, and it's a little stronger. Some would say one has to do with something that's incidental, the other one has to do with something that's more intentional. But it's really hard to verify that. They're very close together. But it seems that one could also speak more of a blockade, a real hindrance to a brother or sister in Christ. So consider the problem here. 
best way to look at this with respect to God's love. Differing convictions on debatable things. We have differing convictions on debatable things. Sometimes they could be activities that we do. Sometimes they could really be doctrines that, that seem to make such a difference that we have a hard time accepting those who don't share our view. Sometimes very strong opinions can abound, and, and strong opinions are fine, but sometimes we can assess people and where they stand with the Lord by whether they hold to our particular view of a doctrine. Uh, I'm an I'm a unabashed Calvinist, and if Calvin were here, he would not want his name invoked for a doctrine, so it's kind of a shorthand, uh, but I hold to the doctrines of grace, and I think it's just a way of talking about the gospel. But I have pl plenty of friends who are Arminian uh, who really struggle with not being able to have that choice to make for Jesus, um, and that's fine. We'll disagree on those things, but where I struggle is, is I, I have uh, Calvinist people I know, and you know online is a place to drop bombs and, and walk away, who will say things like, Arminianism is a false gospel. And that's one thing to say, I don't think it's accurate to the scriptures, and in that sense it's false. But to just say it's a false gospel and then start to say, those who hold to that really don't understand the gospel, maybe they don't even know the Lord. Wow, that's, that's really heavy. That's really harsh. And I remember before I was a Calvinist, uh, I'm pretty sure I knew the Lord and loved the gospel and believed it was through Christ. So, there, so pick your doctrine, that's one. But there are other things where we start to have big question marks about where people stand. So I'll let you think about those things and apply it accordingly. But just to give you a sense, we differ on debatable things that we may not resolve this side of heaven. And here's the interesting thing that Paul brings out. There's really a paradox here. I want you to notice what he says. Verse 14 is sort of a parenthesis. So you could read verse 13, or 13 and go right to, 14, right to 15. But he pauses, in a sense, in verse 14 to say, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. That word for unclean there is, is common, ordinary. Things just for ordinary use, things that, that aren't worth a whole lot. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. He doesn't say some people just think it's unclean. He says it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. What normally is behind this is the conscience, even though that word is never used in this passage, that there are conscience issues, and you should not be in the business of violating your conscience for any reason. And so that is an important matter. He says, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, which can be translated hurt, you are no longer walking in love. And he, he strongly says, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. I want you to think about this paradox then. Here's the paradox. Things, <clears throat> excuse me. The paradox is that some things can be both good and bad. And what Paul means is, everything's clean to me. I have no issues here. I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus. Now, he's not trying to one-up the, the person with the weak mind and say, oh, those weak people, they don't really get the Lord Jesus. But it is the case that there are some things that are absolutely fine and should not be condemned. Well, that's a different matter than someone who says, that may be true, but my conscience is afflicted. I cannot do this. It would be wrong for the weak person in the Lord to, to condemn the one who does it. That would be judgmental. But it would also be wrong for that person to say, well, since they think it's right, I guess I'll go along with it, and I don't want to be the only one here who doesn't act. I don't want to be the odd person out, so I guess I'll just go ahead and do it, even though it violates and offends my conscience. That's not a good thing. So it is a reality that some, some things are both clean and unclean. Clean to you, unclean to others. And that's the challenge that Paul's wrestling with. What is the solution then? With debatable things, nothing is unclean, says Paul, with Christ as his witness, but some things are to our Christian family. The solution is yield to the weaker believer. This is John Stott, he said it so well. Purpose to avoid putting either a hindrance, that's that proskama, the first word, 
that's translated as stumbling block, or a snare, a scandalon, that's translated hindrance for us, in your brother or sister's path, and so causing him or her to trip and fall. He says, why should the strong, or I was asking the question, why should the strong be the one to give in? And the answer is, well, the strong are able to do without certain things without hurting themselves. You can, with, you can abstain and say, it's not going to hurt me. I like doing that. But it's not going to hurt me to not do it. Whereas the weak are unable to indulge. They're unable to go in your direction without bringing harm to themselves, without hindering, hurting, or the language is really strong, destroying themselves or having you destroy them. How strong is that idea of destroy? Well, if you'll look with me at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9, you'll find a, a, a similar context having to do with food offered to idols that Paul goes on to say. That means absolutely nothing. We don't believe in false gods. There is no God but God. So there's really no problem. Yet, not all possess, verse 7, he says, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7, not, not all possess this knowledge. Not everybody's there in their mind. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak, that's where we get the conscience from Romans and, and the weak person, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? And if his conscience is weak to, to eat food offered to idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, that's a heavy word. There's debate about whether that means destroyed by way of eternal perdition or whether that means their, their life just comes to ruin. It's hard to know fully, but it has a deep impact on their life. The brother for whom Christ died. Listen to this. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. Oh, this is so strong, brothers and sisters. You sin against Christ. How far would Paul go? Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, this food offered to idols, listen, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now, you have to understand that in context. That doesn't mean Paul would never go anywhere in his life and have a piece of meat, but he'll be very, very, very concerned. He'd be willing to give up something forever if it came down to that reality of offending his brother or sister. What is the reason then? To love them like Christ did. To love them like Christ did. He says that so clearly here. As you get down to verse 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. You're not acting in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And what is behind that? The one for whom Christ died. They belong to, to God. They belong to Christ as we saw in the first 12 verses. But they are also loved by Christ. Loved even unto death. Again, a, a great quote from John Stott. If, if, sacri if Christ sacrifices himself for their well-being, should we act in a way which leads them to being harmed? Christ dies for their well-being and then we turn to the opposite. We go ahead and sacrifice them for the sake of doing what we want to do. If Christ died to save them, should we not care for, or should we not care, or excuse me, should we not care not to destroy them? We should care, right? Is this not what love does? I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. If we fail to defer, we're actually not walking in love at all. A great way to think about this is a great line. Love limits our own liberty. That's really important to keep in mind no matter what you're doing. To be alert and say it does matter, not to say, oh, geez, they're so legalistic. They don't like, they're not for anything. Well, that's one way to go about it. 
The other way is to say, well, God really has some strong words about being very concerned for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so love limits our own liberty. I did come across something I thought would be, be helpful to you, though. Uh, <clears throat> how far should we go in applying this? If we fully apply what Paul says, will not our conduct be controlled by the narrowest Christian in the church? And that's really the question that, that often comes up in our minds, right? It is indeed possible for disordered personalities to dominate the church. This is uh, Kent Hughes. I once remember having a self-consciously pious Christian grimly say to me that Scripture nowhere records that Jesus smiled or laughed. And he wanted me to know that godly people like himself followed suit. The absurdity of this argument from silence is seen if you make a list of other things the scriptures never mention Jesus doing. So we are not called to an uncritical, indiscriminate limitation of our freedom. Donald Gray Bardhouse, back in 1928, was speaking at a conference in Pennsylvania. There were about 200 young people. And one day, two women came to him in horror because some girls were not wearing stockings. And these women wanted Dr. Barnhouse to rebuke them. And here's how he replied. Looking them straight in the eye, I said, the Virgin Mary never wore stockings. They gasped and said, she didn't? I answered, in Mary's time, stockings were unknown. So far as we know, they were first worn by prostitutes in Italy in the 15th century when the Renaissance began. Later, a lady of the nobility wore stockings at a court ball, greatly to the scandal of many people. And before long, however, everyone in the upper classes was wearing stockings. These ladies, who were holdovers from the Victorian epoch, had no more to say. I did not rebuke the girls for not wearing stockings. A year or two afterward, most girls in the United States were going without stockings in summer, and nobody thought anything about it. Nor do I believe that this led toward the disintegration of moral standards in the United States. The times are changing, and the step away from Victorian legalism was all for the better. So voluntarily limiting our freedom is not meant to subject us to the hostility or the legalism or the prejudices of Christians. Here's the key, who are very well established in the faith, but are persistent in a sub-biblical legalism. In the context of the Roman church, they were young in the faith, and they were still wrestling with some of these food issues. Now, that's the biggest part this morning because it covers sort of the whole problem. So the rest of this will be pretty straightforward. As you think about the call not to cause or be the cause of the stumbling and, and falling of your brother and sister in Christ, the next reason is for the sake of God's kingdom. When you look at verse 17, you find something very interesting. Paul's speaking about a very practical issue and in being concerned about uh, God's love for people or Christ's love. You know, he's, I should finish up with verse 16 and say, for the, for the fact of God's love, don't let what you regard as good, something that's legitimate, be evil spoken of because of how you interact by not walking in love. But when it comes to the theological rationale, notice how he shifts here in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ, that is, serves Christ in this way, is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Now that goes on to the next reason, but... I want you to think about the kingdom of God. Paul doesn't point out the kingdom of God a whole lot, but he does in this occasion. And the thing that you want to think about that he's doing right here in this regard for the kingdom of God is, is helping us distinguish between what is important and what is unimportant. He says, you know, the nature of God's kingdom and God's rule and his reign and what he's doing in the church, it has nothing to do with eating or drinking. And certain things, let's just apply that generally, it has nothing to do with half of the, the uh, secondary issues or 
that we make a major issue. It has to do, he gives these key themes of uh, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So you have to discern what is important versus what is unimportant. What hill are you willing to die on for the sake of your brother or sister's faith in Christ? That's one thing. Two other ways to look at it is don't overestimate the peripheral. Don't overestimate things that, that you're going to take a stand for because you have freedom in Christ. And you make a big deal of something that you could really just do without that isn't the essence of who you are in Christ. Then on the other hand, don't underestimate the eternal or ethical. Now why do I say eternal and ethical? Well, there's a big debate over the nature of Paul's meaning of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. One sense of it is that he is giving a Trinitarian definition of the kingdom. What, is, what does it mean to be in the kingdom? Well, you have the righteousness, we know it's the righteousness of Christ. You have peace with God, which is not so much a subjective, but the wall has been torn down. The Lord has, uh, God has accepted you. His wrath has been paid, and so there is uh, legal, legitimate, official peace between you and God. You are no longer under his wrath, and then there is joy, a status of joyfulness in the Holy Spirit through the gospel. And you can imagine the other aspect is ethical. There is, in the kingdom of God, it's not focused on those surface things and those pet issues, those secondary issues. It's focused on righteous living. It's focused on being a peacemaker and enjoying peace in the Lord and then having a joyful spirit and spreading that joy, being a person of joy, not somebody who's, oh, here, here comes Sister Susie. She's going to take issue. Here it comes. Or, or you're going to you know, flaunt your freedom in Christ and, and, and make everybody uncomfortable. It's not about that. It's about focusing on God's kingdom. And so you can almost hear it in there, even though Paul never references it. We can hear it in Jesus' words, which Paul typically echoes here. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. If your focus is on the Lord and not on yourself and not on what you have determined is important, and you have a lot of latitude, because you realize this is someone for whom Christ died, and I want to have the utmost respect and the utmost love for that person and their convictions, you have a whole different approach. You'll be focused on righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's another reason that he gives us, and that is for the sake of church growth. Now, hopefully I'm using church growth in the right way here. That's a, a trigger for some who think about techniques and, and uh, dry ice and... Uh, flashing lights and those kinds of things. We're talking about what God's doing. If you were to read Ephesians, you'd, you'd be coming to a place of understanding that our Lord is at work to bring us to a place of maturity. He's given us pastors and teachers uh, and gifts in the body that we may be brought to full maturity in Christ and not blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but to the fullness of maturity in Christ. And that is the idea here when Paul goes on to say, whoever thus serves Christ, well, that, that's part of the uh, kingdom of God. If you're serving Christ in that way and you have the right approach to the kingdom, that's pleasing to God. And the, the fruit of that is it will also be pleasing to your brothers and sisters. It could also mean to those in the world around you. But he says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual up in it. Who's he talking to? He's talking about the body of Christ. God is in the business of bringing us to full maturity. So what does that look like in this passage here? Well, I think it's important to note that he's, he uses a phrase that he's not used elsewhere when he speaks of, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. You can find the, fa fra find the phrase works of God, but here's Paul unusually using this phrase, the work of God. If you're thinking about building up, the language here has to do with a building. Edification has to do metaphorically with building a church building. We are the living stones being built together. God is in the business of building a church. Calvary, brothers and sisters, we must never forget, is a work of God. 
We can get agitated with one another. We can get agitated about all kinds of issues. We can, we can have struggles because guess what? We're human. We're fallible. Uh, we have legitimate gripes. All that, everything in between. But we have to always be sure to check our hearts at the door because this is a work of God. And it's serious business to disrupt the unity of the work of God. To bring division. To bring our let's say, our unbiblical communication, our wrong attitudes into the context of the work of God. We have to always respect what this is. There's something incredibly divine and powerful with the name of Christ as our Lord. It reveals how precious our Lord's church is and how dangerous this unity is over what he calls anything else that may happen here. We can have nice schedules, dinners, uh, beautiful buildings, uh, traditions, activities, but if we don't have unity and edification is not taking place, it's destructive to the work of God. So what does he say? He says, do what leads to peace. Now that's the NIV. Do what leads to peace. And I like it because he's focused here on the do's and don'ts. But I like the fact that the ESV uses this word pursue. Because he isn't just saying, do what leads to peace. He's saying, run after it, pursue it. Do all you can in the body of Christ to look for peace. Then he goes on from there, calling us to run after it, to do what builds up the congregation. What is it that builds up the body of Christ? We said God's goal is is to bring us to maturity. So in what ways can I make sure what I do and don't do, what I purpose to say, what I purpose to engage in, uh, that I'm totally aware of how this can impact the body of Christ because our goal is to build it up. That's the context he's in. Don't do what breaks it down. That's where he shifts to do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Destroy is actually the word that means to tear down, to, to loosen up, to let go of something so that it is, is uh, not, no longer put together. It's the opposite of building. And he says, look, everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. The argument is not whether it's clean or not clean. The argument is, is this a good thing to do if it destroys your brother or sister or causes that person to stumble or to fall? Do not do what breaks down the body. Do the opposite. And finally, for the sake of personal faith. For the sake of personal faith. There are a couple ways that he, he says it here. It's a little bit tricky. Verses 22 to 23, he says, The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, here's a great example of uh, taking things out of context. You could just take that piece of verse and post it on a wall. This is why I don't witness. The Bible clearly says, literally, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. But we know it's in a context. So we also understand that in that context, he doesn't seem to be talking about saving faith or evangelism. He's talking about, you know, it can be translated belief, right? How about this? I believe that it's absolutely fine to smoke a cigar or take whatever your thing is. I'm not saying that's my thing, but just as an example, I, I believe it's okay to wear a two-piece bathing suit or to go to, we have friends uh, from our, our past who, who think it's wrong to go to the beach because of things you see there so you know you figure out how to dance around that and you live in new jersey like what are we going to do well we're not going to go to the beach but take whatever issue it is it's really hard to kind of put your mind around what the particular issue is it's probably not food in the way that paul's talking about it but if you take that main issue then you say well faith here or belief is is belief in the sense of i believe it's fine I have confident conviction that what I'm doing is okay. So think about faith in that way. What he's saying is don't be judged if you're strong. This is advice for the strong. Don't be judged by your freedom. You have freedom. That's fine. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for you. It's wrong to just do whatever you want if it's going to make somebody stumble The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. You have great confidence, fine. You don't need to go promote your view and try to preach the one who is weak in the faith to your side 
and risk defiling their conscience. And there's a blessing here. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. I approve of this, but I have just brought judgment to myself because I flaunted it in front of a tender-hearted Christian. And then there is advice for the weak. If the strong have to be careful about being judged by their own freedom, the weak have to be careful not to be condemned by their own conviction. Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because he's, his eating is not from faith. So there might be an occasion where you're the only one in the group, and so you give in the pressure. You might actually be in a situation where someone pressures you. That might be the sense of causing a hindrance. But for whatever reason, don't do it. For whatever does not proceed from faith, whatever does not flow from your conviction, your strong affirmation that this is what I should do is absolutely sinful. How could you summarize that then? Like this, do all things with a clear conscience. Just make sure that what you do is done with a clear conscience. And the clear conscience means I have to ask, what shape does this take in the context of my brothers and sisters? And because Paul leaves it at principles we have to be concerned with, well, there are people who can be legalistic and they want to force their will on everybody else. So that is a factor that you have to work into it. But there's a way to conduct yourself in responding to that. And there is the reality that that doesn't mean if there's somebody uh, that you know of in the body of Christ who doesn't think it's good to say smoke or that it's wrong, that you should never do it anywhere. But you certainly should be sensitive. Um, so you're going out to Olive Garden, you're enjoying a good meal, you know this other person is a teetotaler, and you think, well, you know, I'm going to just order the tallest glass of beer I can because they know that I'm okay with it. Um, that's sort of in your face, right? And sometimes you can say, do you mind? And is that okay with you guys? I know you don't drink. And they might be like, oh, yeah, sure, because inside they're going, I'm not going to just tell them they can't here. That would cross. So then all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're, you're causing a, uh, a possible violation of conscience. So there are things that you have to wade through and the, thankfully, the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit. So let me conclude this way. I always come down here so I can see it a little better. But remember, we have this list, and, and you could add to it, of course. And we've kind of come down to some categories of things that you might wrestle with. And I, I encourage you, as your pastor, to consider where am I weak and where am I strong? Because there's areas where we judge other people, areas where we... We uh, draw strong conclusions. That's one thing. In this section about not offending each other, I would leave you with these two questions. Where might I tend to flaunt my freedom? Now, we all have that bent in us to be able to say, that's weird, they're really stuck on this. I don't know, hey, you know, I'm not at all. Well, that's great. But where do you tend to maybe flaunt your freedom? And maybe a more general question then to, to leave with you is, in what area can I become more others oriented so there i'm thinking about love i'm thinking about what could possibly hurt someone i'm thinking about the fact that we differ greatly and there could be a collision so how can i avoid that because i want to be all about christ and his love this person as weird as quirky as sensitive as they may be they belong to jesus he loves this person enough to die for him how can i have that before me now let me close on this note then I had made one comment here about being others-oriented. Why is this text so difficult to apply? Here's what I'm thinking. Americans take care of themselves. We have individual rights, rights to privacy, rugged individualism, American pride. I did this myself. So when we come to church, we come by our choice. We stay in our own lane. We take care of our own spirituality. But Paul's exhortation here assumes something. It assumes that we are committed to building each other up. It assumes that we are not running out as soon as the church service is over, coming at the, at the bell, leaving at the bell. But we're actually here to say, hey, we want to mix it up. We want to have fellowship. He's expecting that to happen. That there will be heavy interaction, and therefore there's going to be potential offense because it doesn't take long before we say something stupid or do something insensitive. 
If you have a dear and close friend, you surely know that you have to learn to bear with and work through things that happen and things that get said. We get to know each other and we say, oh, I have a dear friend. They, they're definitely quirky in this area and it drives me crazy, but I've learned to live with it. But our problem in America is we, we try not to get too much in the mix. We kind of go and do our own thing and take care of ourselves and that's it. That's not how God designed the church. He wants us to engage each other. I had a friend out east uh, when we were shifting our convictions and moving toward Presbyterianism and the, the one gal said, well, I know things get heated in the church. That's why my husband and I, we just come and focus on the sermon and, and jet out of there. And I said, oh, really? Said, yeah, we're not, we're not, literally said, we're not there to make friends or, or mix it up. We're just there to worship. So her, her idea was that she comes for her own personal reasons and her consumer concept is met. She gets what she came for. She gets the product and she rolls out. And that way, she felt good if there was any conflict in the church. She had no idea what was going on. I don't get into that stuff. Well, that's a nice, safe way to play it. Unfortunately, it's not the way of Jesus Christ. So may you be convinced uh, to engage and to love on your brothers and sisters and to receive one another the way God has designed us. Father, thank you for your word. Build us up now in your good faith. We thank you for it. Help us to change. Help us to be others-oriented. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Then our closing song this morning relates to the kingdom. That's as close as I could come. If there is a dearth of songs, a lack of songs in Christ's church, it is songs about loving one another. Check the hymn books. Check the scripture indexes in the books. about. Uh, if you look up love one another, find the references. Try to find a hymn connected with that. You won't, except blessed be the tie that binds. So, all you songwriters out there, focus on ones about us loving each other. All right, let's sing together. Lead on, O King Eternal. All right, I thought we were programmed to stand for the last verse. What is going on? Let's stand together. Receive now the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times and now and forever. Amen.